big heart and Professor um, Kali for letting us use their lab and for our group for really mentoring us through this entire process. So we did our project on wireless power transfer by the means of inductive coupling. So wired, they limit us, they cause so much clutter. As you can see by this picture, no one wants that. No one ever wants that. And I know when you have your purse and you have your phone cable and you can't find it, it's not in another booth. That's always annoying. So what should we do? We should eliminate wires. So in this presentation, we're not gonna only talk about the application of wireless power transfer, but we're going to talk about what it specifically is. We're gonna go over the principles of which wireless power transfer is possible, and then the design that we use for our circuit. Also, we'll go through each step of how we um, went through the process of our circuit and then the results that we gathered from it. So a wireless feature, that's the goal, right? Not to have to plug anything in. Well, these are some examples of prototypes and actual wireless products out there. So this is a prototype of a wirelessly powered car. As you can see, there's a charging station underneath the car, but it's not actually touching it. That would just, that would be phenomenal. You would not have to actually plug your car in. It would be wirelessly charged. So then we have a wireless phone charger. You never have to plug your phone in. And with that, you can truly have a waterproof phone. That means that there's no open ports on your phone because it does not need to be plugged in. And then lastly, wirelessly powered medical devices. It not only creates a more non-invasive procedures, but it gives the doctors more insight into the human body. So what is wireless power transfer? Wireless power transfer, or WPT, is basically the transfer of power without a physical connection. And there are two methods of wireless power transfer. We have radiant methods, which include lasers and microwaves. And then we have non-radiant methods, which include capacitive coupling and inductive coupling. In our circuit, we use inductive coupling. So these are the principles that we had to comprehend and understand in order to understand why inductive power transfer is possible. The first one is Faraday's law of induction, which basically states that when you have an alternating field and it cuts to a coil and create a, a coil that has an that generates an electric motive force, which is also known as a voltage, it induces in proportion to the change in flux, flux the measure and number of magnetic field lumps. And then we have Lenz's law, which is the voltage that was induced by a coil, and it will oppose the direction of the original electromotive force, and that is following Newton's third law, which is every action has an equal and opposite reaction. This formula right here, that is the symbol for electric motor force, but we, I already stated it's voltage. Then we have this symbol right here, the negative sign, which it represents Newton's law, which is the opposite the direction of the electric motor force. That's what that represents, the opposite direction of the force. Then I have N, which stands for the number of turns in your coil. Then we have D5 um, over DT, which is the change of magnetic flux over the change of time. We'll pass it on to Marco. All right. Um, inductive coupling is one of the most basic forms of wireless power transfer, and it's usually limited by a short transfer range. But for the purpose of our experiment, it wasn't a problem because we were using very short distances. Um, every wire generates its own magnetic field when a current is passed through it. And by coiling a wire, you can amplify this field. Um, the, this energy can be, uh, this energy that's stored in the magnetic field can be transferred wirelessly to a, another system uh, by means of inductive coupling, uh, described in Faraday and Lenz's law. Uh, there are multiple factors of inductance of a coil that affect the inductance of that coil. Um, there's the number of wire turns, the surface area of the coil, the coil length, in which we're referring to the length of wire used to make that coil, and the core material. In our case, the coils we designed all used a air coil, uh, an air core. Uh, we didn't wrap it around a magnetic material. It was wrapped around air. Um, and the number of wire turns in all of our coils was eight. So what we were modifying was the coil surface area and the length of the wire. Um, by this equation, the more surface area you have, the higher inductance you should have, and 
the longer the wire, the less inductance you should have due to the internal resistance of the wire. The objective of our experiment was to determine the effect of coil geometry and coil dimensions on inductive power transfer efficiency and transfer range. And to do this, we designed a circuit which uh, operates using inductive coupling. Um, which uh, composed of a primary transmitting circuit and a secondary receiving circuit. And uh, since we were using a DC, uh, 9 volt DC battery as our power source, we needed to run the power through an oscillator in order to generate an AC current due to um, Faraday's law which states that we need a change in flux in order to induce a voltage. And by using an alternating current, we're creating an alternating field where the flux is changing. Um, and this is possible through the use of the oscillator, which is the inductors marked by L and the capacitors by C. Um, and in order for this to function properly, we also have uh, two more components uh, featuring a electronic switch in the form of a transistor. Um, and when positive values, positive voltages are applied uh, through the base of the transistor and the collector of the transistor, uh, current will flow in this direction. And the, by means of this and the RC component we have here, we're able to regulate the current and ensure that the uh, switch is going on and off and the oscillator works properly. Uh, on the other side, we have our secondary receiving circuit. Um, the voltage uh, is induced onto the, uh, is transferred onto the secondary circuit in the form of an AC current. Um, and since our, L our LED uh, runs on DC current, uh, we have a rectifier which uh, changes the current back to DC. And uh, it's notable that it's a half bridge diode, which is uh, functioning as our rectifier, and that means it only takes the uh, positive voltages it's receiving, uh, so that accounts for a power law. And here are the component values used in our circuit and the part numbers of the diode and transistor. And we, here is a test circuit we designed on a breadboard initially to make sure our design worked. And as you can see, it did. So then we moved it to a much more stable connection on a perf board. And here we can see the final circuit we used for experimentation on a, with the small diameter coils we designed, which is one of four sets of coils we use for experimentation. All right, so uh, the main thing we're testing is the effect of uh, the coil geometry. So in order to do this, we created four separate coils. Uh, so you saw on the previous slide, we have the smaller diameter circle coil, coil. And additionally, we made a square coil, a larger diameter circle coil, and an elliptical coil. Uh, we also got the dimensions of the coils have a better understanding about how the geometry affects the uh, power transfer. Uh, so the green coil, uh, the square coil, had the longest coil length, which we associated with the lower inductance because there's more resistance within the coil. Uh, and also the electrical coil, we had an estimated coil length because uh, there's no way to find an absolute value of an ellipse's perimeter using uh, the side length, the width and height. So we have an approximation there. Uh, so with these coils, or with the circuit and the coils, uh, we use probes to test the basically the voltages and current uh, flowing through the input and output circuit. Um, and we use probes and measure uh, parts of the circuit. So in channel one, we're seeing the uh, voltage coming from the DC battery. So it's a generally straight line. Um, and that's the dark blue, and then in the lighter blue, channel two, that's gonna be the LED, or excuse me, the receiving coil voltage. Um, and that's gonna be oscillating, and we get the sine wave here, because uh, as we said, we had an oscillator to make an AC current. And then on channel three, we'll have the voltage going to the LED, and that's gonna be a straight line because we use the rectifier to make the AC current in this. And you'll notice that the LED voltage is actually greater than the voltage going to the coil. Uh, and that's because we had to use the RMS value, the root mean square value, to uh, get the uh, kind of number of the DC equivalent of an AC voltage going through the receiving coil. 
Uh, so that's why that value is smaller, even though it makes more sense for being bigger. And then in channel four, uh, lastly, we got the current, and that's going to be the receiving coil. Uh, we took the current of both receiving and transmitting coil to get a uh, feel for how much power was generated and received uh, in our circuit. Uh, so we took like 70 pictures from the oscilloscope and turned them into graphs. So here we're coming the efficiency. We have basically the power going to the uh, receiving circuit and then the power uh, leaving the transmitting circuit. And you multiply by 100 to get whole numbers. Um, so as you see, the elliptical coil, the black line, had the best efficiency at one centimeter. And we figured this was because of the shorter coiling compared to some of the other coils. Uh, however, it immediately lost a lot of the efficiency, and we attribute that to just the inferior design. Uh, the large diameter coil, we uh, had the best efficiency overall in the long run, uh, and we attribute that to this uh, larger area. Uh, and here we have the output voltage, which kind of shows the effectiveness of the different coil designs. Uh, so the square coil was the most, uh, had the highest output voltage. Uh, and we figure that has to do also with the area because more uh, voltage will be able to be stored in the coils for the square coil. And the conclusion we can draw between the large and small diameter of coil is that the larger surface area uh, is linked to more output voltage and more uh, power transfer. Uh, and then here we use, uh, we've gathered the frequency also when we tested and we could use the frequency to calculate uh, an effective inductance using this formula. Um, and as you can see, frequency is inversely related to inductance, and our graphs kind of tell the same story. As frequency decreases for all of our coils, the inductance goes up. Um, so there's certain limitations for our particular circuit in our uh, design. And the first thing that's uh, low range, we weren't able to really light the LED up above three centimeters. And we stopped our test at five centimeters because the power transfer was just so low. Uh, and also, low power, or we use a nine volt battery as our source. And I, I believe the wattage we were receiving by the battery was like a fraction of one watt, so it was very low power. And then also, our particular design was low efficiency. We're getting, I think with the elliptical coil at one centimeter, we're getting just over 40% efficiency. Whereas for a wired power transfer system, we're getting over 90% efficiency. So for more application, we have to get the efficiency much higher. Uh, and also one thing in our particular thing is circuit is that it's half the energy is lost in the rectifying of the circuit and receiving coil. Uh, and that's because we use a half inch diode to only take the positive value. So in order to increase the uh, effectiveness of our design, we would consider using a full bridge diode in the future. Yeah, I don't 
So from this specific research project, not only did I gain a better understanding of circuit theory, but I got to solve the solder on a perf board, which I had only done once, but not on a perf board. So I thought that was really interesting how I got to learn, well, like the one time I did it, I had to do it, otherwise I had to do a new perf board, and that was a lot of, like, it was a good experience. I also improved our research presentation skills, because we probably presented the same presentation in different versions, like these slides. When I came to this program, I was hoping to get a better understanding of engineering and the various fields of engineering, and I totally got that, and I'm really happy that, that was, I was able to fulfill my goal of understanding. So. Um, I put uh, that I gained valuable knowledge of electronics and circuit theory. Uh, my, I know my dad knows a lot about that, but <laughs> I haven't really uh, gotten interested in that, but I think I, I can have a conversation with him on those things. <laughs> um, uh, better fields of college, uh, campus and college life. It was fun uh, living here at the Grant House. Um, exposure to teamwork with peers to solve problems. Uh, it's just it's always a great experience to work with other people. Um, and uh, experience writing a formal research paper. Because I know we had to do a lot of format. Uh, we had to reformat a lot of times and rewrite some stuff. But uh, it's, it, it'll probably be easier now again after having done it once. All right, so um, I got an improved understanding of the logarithmic circuits because I mean, in physics class we had a kind of foundation, but we were not exposed to any of the stuff that we use in our project, uh, really. And then also I was like practicing the actual research paper um, or technical paper because I mean, in school we don't write technical papers really at all. So it's nice to get a uh, feel of that for go to college. Um, and also the introduction to graduate research because we were able to walk through a numerous labs of different graduate students and see all the cool stuff they were doing, which was fun. And also the hands-on work with the light equipment, like we're using an oscilloscope that costs like thousands, 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 thousands. Yeah. So that was cool because we were not able to do that in high school. So. <laughs>